Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates LLP, which is a full service, fully integrated global firm with over 40 offices on five continents and 1,900 attorneys. We have a deep history in tech and venture, and I'm excited to talk to you today about how to raise seed funding for your startup, convertible notes, and safes. Before we get underway, uh, I want to share just a little bit of background information of, about today's event. I'm going to be running the tech in the background in addition to presenting. So if there are any snafus or if I look a little distracted at any, mo any point in time, it's because I'm both presenting and also running the tech. So I appreciate your patience. Additionally, as you are now aware, today's event is being recorded. So the great thing is if you miss some or all of it, so long as you registered, I will send you a copy of the recording within a week or so, maybe even as soon as a couple of days. Uh, please, if th that means because it's, it's uh, being recorded and because we're live and as a public audience, please don't share any confidential information. This isn't the venue for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So with those things underway, uh, the only other point of information is if you'd like to communicate with me, please use the Q&A. Um, as we move through today's material, we'll spend about the first hour of me presenting. I will try and take some questions as they are targeted and on point to the material that we're moving through. And then we'll have about a half hour on the back end for Q&A. Let's, let's get started. Okay, so. I must be the lawyerly one in the room uh, and, and provide a few caveats here, right? So today's discussion is general information about the venture capital and emerging growth company space. It's not meant to be legal advice for you. You know, we're going to be discussing rules, exceptions to rules, exceptions to the exceptions, certain fact situations. They may or may not apply to your situation. So in order to get specific competent legal advice, you need to retain counsel who can become apprised of the facts and give you that specific advice that you need. So the corollary to all that is my off the cuff answers to your questions are not and should not be taken as legal advice to you. And similarly, if you reach out to me, and, and I do encourage that because I just love giving additional information to the community. You know, If you provide me with information, it's not confidential. Uh, unless until you're a client. And any information I give back is going to be sort of generally oriented as to how, you know, one might view things from the perspective of a venture capital attorney, you know, being based in the Bay Area. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. Super. So today's presentation is going to basically kind of move as follows. We're going to start with background information, my background, your background. So please fill out the audience survey. Uh, we're gonna talk about structural considerations uh, for your startup and kind of what we typically see them structured as. We'll talk about considerations when you're gonna be raising from venture capitalists and, and other players in the space. We're gonna be talking about financing options. We'll be talking about key considerations uh, for convertible securities, right? That's kind of what we're here about. We're, and we'll talk about that more, but that's what we're talking about, convertible securities today. We'll be talking about valuation and dilution, uh, because make no mistake, if uh, you are raising money, whether it's uh, using a safe or a convertible note, you are selling a chunk of the company. Uh, you know, maybe you won't know exactly what proportion of chunk that is, uh, and we'll talk about why that is, but you're selling a piece of the company. So you got to get it, you have to get a sense for what your capitalization roadmap and path is going to look like. We'll talk about common pitfalls, and then we'll take Q&A. Uh, and again, we'll take Q&A sort of throughout. So please, if you've got a question, use the Q&A function. I'll be keeping an eye on that, and I'll try and answer questions that have general applicability and are topically relevant as we move through the material today. If you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, that's great. It's just Jason Putnam Gordon on LinkedIn. And then my email is jason.gordon at klgates.com. Let's keep moving. 
All right, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm an emerging growth and venture capital attorney. I'm with k l Gates. My office is in San Francisco, but I work with companies not only in the Bay Area, but throughout the country and throughout the world. That's sort of one of the advantages of being in the hub of the Bay Area is we're sort of central and venture and tech usually kind of moves through here, at least in one way or another. Love working with companies as they're sort of inbound and they're expanding and coming into the U.S., whether that's to go after this market, you know, in terms of customers, or if it's because they have suppliers here, or if it's because they want to raise funds here. And, you know, my particular passion is working with entrepreneurs and executives, and also uh, with investors as outside counsel, basically understanding what the strategic business vision is, and then working with them in terms of financings as they grow, and then eventually M&A exits or other kinds of exits, you know, whether SPACs or IPOs. Um, and I have to say one other thing that I typically bring to the table is I'm a bit of an entrepreneur myself. I worked for a very large firm for a while, uh, started my own firm and ran that for about five or six years before I ended up back in big law. So I understand what it's like to start and build a company from scratch. And uh, I bring that perspective to the table too. I feel like that really resonates with a lot of my clients. Great. So let's take a look who's in the room. I'm going to give you uh, just another moment or two to fill out the survey. I'd love to see what that is. And then I see we have a question about a replay. Yes. So today's event is being recorded. So long as you have registered uh, within a few days, you'll get a copy of the recording. All right, I'm gonna end the poll in five, four, three, two, one, super duper. All right, um, we've got a strong contingent of folks from the Bay Area, about 30%, another 50% from elsewhere in the US. And I think that's pretty typical when I do these evening events. Um, but again, the event's recorded today. And so we typically also have about 40% of the folks actually show up live. And then we've got a lot of, um, a lot of folks who watch the replay. And to those of you who are watching and recording, thank you. I'm delighted that you're here and you're spending this time with us. A uh, few folks in Europe, uh, some more in Asia, and then we've got some folks from some and Australia and then somewhere else. Somewhere else is typically, uh, I, I would like to think maybe outer space, but pro probably, um, you know, uh, we've gotten Middle East, before we've gotten Central America, lots of great places. We've got a lot of first time entrepreneurs in the room. That is very common. I'm very used to helping coach first time entrepreneurs through this. Um, so I feel like I do a pretty good job at that. And we'll, we'll kind of maybe um, make sure you get your needs met today. 53% of the room. We've got serial entrepreneurs in the room. Love working with those folks as well. And um, you know, typically we'll find that these are helpful for serial entrepreneurs, these conversations, these, these uh, presentations. So looking forward to that. Uh, and then in terms of kind of where people are in their company's life cycle, we've got some early stage companies, which in the next slide, you'll sort of see why I would expect to see that. And then we've got some folks in growth stages and then mature companies and some venture investors. Um, love working with my venture and angel investors and some students and some folks in academia and none in government today, nor any members of the press. So I'm gonna share these results for a moment or two, and then let's get, let's get moving. So what I always like to do uh, in these conversations, because I find that there's just typically such a wide range of experience and familiarity with venture, is that I like to sort of start off with just kind of laying the groundwork, getting a sense for what the structural considerations are what we're talking about today. That's sort of my framing perspective. So when we're talking about venture-backed companies in today's conversation, we're thinking about companies that are going to grow and scale rapidly and that need a substantial amount of capital, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in order to get fully built out, fully mature, um, in order to take advantage of, of an opportunity. You know, whether that is bringing a new product or service to market, a better product or service to market, or developing a new market. That's what it's going to take to get there. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about what we'd expect to see about the investors who play in this space. Um, but before we even get there, I think it's always really helpful to understand, you know, there's a path here and there is a, a typical common life cycle. Now, you can, you can uh, deviate from that life cycle, but again, today's conversation is general information and what we sort of typically expect to see, not the one-off. So with that in mind, the life cycle is sort of broken up from basically inception, you know, time is at the, on the x-axis here. And in inception, right, you're just in cash burn mode. You don't really even have any customers. You don't have any customers. You're focused on building out the initial MVP, the minimum viable product, whether that's a good or a service, starting to get it to market, and of course, getting that initial team. And that is your seed capital stage. And we've definitely sort of seen, and over the last 10 years or so, that the usual entry point for venture investors, you know, absent, and it depends a little bit on the space you're in, right? If you're in um, biotech, for example, you know, you may not actually have a product that comes to market for years after you get venture investment, but that's a different animal. In the animal that we're sort of talking about today, by and large, you've got a product or a service, you're in the market, you've got customers, there's that customer draw, they're pulling, right? They want more. And what's going to take your company that re to really get that hockey stick that we're starting to see on this graph as you kind of move past that first dotted line is capital. You know, capital to scale and expand production and or sales or, and or add engineers to build out more features or, or, or capture, you know, capture another piece of the market. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so we're talking about that space before then, right? So getting that MVP together, getting those initial customers to sort of prove that you're going to get some customer traction and getting that initial team, if I didn't say that. Uh, and what do we see here? Well, typically we will end up seeing a Delaware C Corp. That is a Delaware corporation that is taxed as a C Corp, which is a separate tax entity. Let me, let me tell you why, Okay. Whether it's a venture back company or any other company, we always kind of run them through the same framework. Let's take a look at what your tax issues are going to be. Let's take a look at your liability issues that you're facing and whether or not you know you want to expose yourself to personal liability. Let's take a look at the ownership structure you need to have and whether or not you'll be giving any equity incentive compensation, right? Issuing stock options to employees and other service providers. What your capital raising requirements are what your management requirements are going to be. How is this company going to need to be run? What your exit plan is going to look like? And what is the regulatory framework in the space in which you're going to be operating, right? Some areas are highly regulated, healthcare, fintech, et cetera. Other spaces, less so, right? There's almost, regulation almost always touches on something, especially these days with respect to, you know, privacy, uh, which is a hot topic. But again, some places are, are more regulated than others. And we find that when we run that matrix on these companies that have this sort of business plan and life cycle that you see on the screen here, we find there's a push to a Delaware C-Corp because that's what your investors are going to want to see. And your investors are going to want to see that because if you're going to be raising successive rounds of venture capital, so that's, you're looking on this little diagram, first, second, third, right? That can correlate to seed A, B, C, D, et cetera, or A, B, C, D, kind of how it goes. Um, that's what they're gonna wanna see. And the reason for that is that the venture investors, especially the funds are set up as limited partnerships. And so they are passed through entities from a tax perspective. And so they want to they want to have a corporate blocker so that the profits and losses from all of those companies that they invest in don't get passed on to their limited part, to their limited partners. That's why you end up usually with a C corp. Why Delaware? You may ask. Well, most of the past, most of the reason why uh, we sort of end up there is again sort of a working back perspective. Most of these companies sort of target or at least want to set themselves up to do some sort of IPO exit or SPAC exit these days, or maybe a direct listing. And 
you know, by and large, you see Delaware corporations uh, on these exchanges. The other reason is that Delaware is known for having a very robust, well-developed corporate law, both from the on the statutory side and then also with respect to its case law and the Delaware Chancery. There's also known for being a little bit more liability protection for directors and officers, and venture investors are typically going to end up wanting to have members, or they're going to want to have a seat at the board table. And uh, Delaware Secretary of State's office is also really good at moving and processing paperwork. Now, let me take a couple of questions because this slide usually triggers a lot of those. And let's answer it. All right. <laughs> Someone says I'm missing Canada from the geographical list. I, I apologize. You know, I tried to break it up more or less by continent. Um, Someone's mentioning that there's a California C Corp. So I would say 10 to 20 years ago, it was pretty common to see, especially if you're based in California, to see corporations sort of started as California corporations. Um, Apple might even still be a California corporation. I don't, I don't know. They're, they're, but they're out there. Um, it, it's just less common these days. And, and many times we'll see if you do start out with a, a California corporation or if you start out with some sort of LLC, the venture investors will sort of make a requirement in order to close that initial round, the price round to be a Delaware C Corp. So by and large, uh, I typically just start with the philosophy of figure out where you want to go and set yourself up to get there. Um, and don't try and re-engineer things because especially, you know, if you are trying to re-domicile later or you're trying to flip into an LLC, either by a conversion or a merger, um, those things can be done, uh, but they get more expensive and more complicated as time goes by. How, how do you know whether or not it's time to convert your LLC into a C Corp? It's really a very case by case specific basis. Um, you know, one, obviously, if you've got capital that says you need to have a C Corp, then you need to flip. Uh, other times, maybe we wait for an event or other times we'll find that it's just so early, it's cheaper to do it now. Or sometimes if the company is like really, really, really early and things have not gotten underway, like we'll just scrap it and start over. So I can't, that's how we generally sort of answer that question. I can't tell you whether or not that's right or not for you. Um, I think is questions about Nevada corporations. Lots of people want to know, is a Nevada corporation going to be the right one for me? Aren't they sort of more, add more confidentiality? Um, I have no opinion with respect to Nevada corporations outside of the venture context. In the venture context, we just don't see them, at least being sort of in the Bay Area specifically, we don't see them set up. I mean, one thing that you have to keep in mind, especially if you are going to be doing business in California, um, is that you're going to need to qualify as a foreign corporation do it out here and you'll need to list your directors and officers, et cetera. And so um, at least with respect to the directors and officers, you're not getting really any kind of additional privacy. Um, We've got some questions I'm going to say for a little bit later. Yeah, there are some questions I'll say for, okay, so we got a California S Corp question. So um, you can't take venture investment and have an S Corp because there can only be one kind of one class of stock and the venture investors are going to want preferred. So you're not going to last as a S Corp just as a matter of tax law. Now, whether and when it's time or should you flip from California, um, again, it's a bit beyond, I can't answer that just off of a single question, but the S-Corp question I want to hit because that's a common one. Do you need to have a presence in your home state? Then we're talking about basically qualifying as a foreign corporation doing business in any of the states in which you're doing business. So yeah, if you've got um, a presence in your state, you're gonna to need to get listed there. 
Will seed invest? All right, we're going to save some of these questions for a little bit later. Okay. So this is, I think, still kind of sticking in one sense with like the background information so we can understand where it is that we're going. But the consideration for when you're going out and potentially raising money for and from investors is second one's probably the most important one, at least from my perspective, making sure that you're complying with securities laws, right? So that is if you're selling stock, if you're selling safes, if you're selling convertible notes, et cetera, um, those are going to be securities. And you know, here in the US, they're regulated both on the at the federal level and on the state level. Even if you're a teeny tiny company, they still apply, but there are usually exemptions from the onerous registration requirements. Um, and so you want, you're going to want to work with counsel and make sure that you hit those exemptions. Overseas or outside the US, you know, different law, different tax. So you're going to need local counsel there. We'll talk probably more about this later, but you know, one of the real pitfalls if you don't comply with the securities laws is that you may, may end up needing to offer all of your investors a right of rescission, that is the ability to get their money back if that money has been spent and the company is not doing so well. Um, it can be the death knell for the company. Now, I think it's always important to understand and know who your audience is. So, in this sense, I mean, remember, VCs, corporate investors, they're people. So by and large, one of the best things you can do, and it's also helpful in terms of compliance with securities laws, is starting to try and build relationships before you're going to be raising capital from them. And in their world, I think it's, it's important to understand there are sort of different sets of players. Um, there are angel investors, okay, and, and this is not the uh, exclusive list because there are lots of, you'll find in the venture sector, there are many names for one thing and one, uh, one thing has many different names. So uh, or it's, uh, it's kind of interesting, but you know, there are angel investors, there are strategic investors, and then there are gonna be venture, more traditional venture funds who sort of play in this early stage space, although mostly angels, I would say, as and, and more sort of venture investors are kind of coming down in the space. And there are even some strategics, but keeping in mind who the players are and what, what it is they're looking for. As I said, sort of at the outset, traditional venture funds have investors and their investors are limited partners and they are expecting a return over time. So you got to understand, I think, a little bit, like how is it that the fund makes its money? And it, the fund makes its money by making a number of bets that is investing in portfolio companies um, with the goal of having a couple really large winners in those portfolios. And they understand there will be a number of companies that, you know, they lose their money on, right? Uh, there'll be a number of companies that they do, okay, maybe they make their money back, maybe it's a fraction, maybe it's a little bit more, but it's the one, two, or three in that that are just going to knock it out of the park. And, you know, that sort of knock it out of the park look is typically, you know, maybe doubling or tripling in value every 18 to 24 months or so. And so you can see if you were to make, be an, an venture investor and you were to make a million dollar investment in the A round, let's say, and it doubles at the B and it doubles at the C and it doubles at the D, you're up to $8 million, right? And then that's, a, that's an 8X return, but it could be greater than that. And, and a true winner probably, I mean, the, the sort of knock your socks off winner would be even greater than that. I mean, you, so you could see you could get eight, 10, 30, 50, maybe even 100x, depending upon when you're coming in. So that is, I think, generally what they are looking for in line with whatever their particular sort of investment space and investment thesis is. And you've got general investors who will look kind of at almost anything. And then you've got sort of vertical specific investors, right? Strategics are in it for a different play, okay? They are in it for any number of different reasons. It could be 
to develop market share for their products, right? They want to be able to sell more widgets, right? Or chips or screens or something. And so they want to seed companies that need their product or that turn around and sell their product to their consumers, right? Um, they could want, they could have trouble innovating, okay? Not trouble innovating, but by and large, right, there's, there's a school of thought out there that small companies are better at innovating than large companies, right? And so as part of their corporate development pipeline, either for talent or for technology, they could be out there making bets, investments to start to build some relationships. Or they could be doing this because they wanna be able to maintain their market share or position and also sort of relevance. Um, and then angels are potentially a bit of a different animal in and of themselves. I mean, each one is sort of a human. Sometimes they band together and they're sort of bands of angels. Um, sometimes there are super angels. So those are angels who cut really large check sizes, you know, maybe 500,000, maybe a million, maybe more. And lots of different things could be motivating them. They could have the desire to support a space. Like we see a lot of that in the climate and energy sector, which is really hot these days. I guess, uh, no pun intended, but it is definitely applicable. Um, or they could have been in a vertical, had, an, had a successful exit, and they kind of want to seed the next set of entrepreneurs and ideas that are in the related area. So it's important to know who they are and start building relationships, personal, substantial relationships with those folks. Um, and some of the ways you can do that, and one of the great things about the internet these days is that, you know, there are a lot of sources of information, you know, from TechCrunch to CrunchBase to PitchBook to site aggregators, um, you know, lots of incubators and accelerators that are out there. Um, and you can start to, you know, once you have a sense for what your company is and what your idea is going to be and what your competition is, you can start seeing who's playing in that space and you can start getting in the mix. So with those, with that laid out, let me just check in with the questions and see if there are some that are related to so investors. Um, yeah. There's a question about walking through the process of receiving a check from an angel investor. Okay, so all, I think this is very timely. What you're gonna wanna do before you receive a check from an angel investor, kind of in a nutshell, is you're gonna wanna vet the angel investor. You're gonna make sure that they're an accredited investor. You're gonna wanna make sure that you have identified what you know, what you're gonna be issuing to them, whether it's a safe or a convertible note. You've negotiated the terms with that angel investor, or if you're gonna be running a process, which is a little bit better. So by process, I mean that you've identified the capital raise that you want in your safe or your convertible note in the aggregate. And, you know, you think, okay, I wanna get, I wanna raise a million dollars because a million dollars is gonna allow me to do X. I'm gonna be able to build a scale model of my prototype and that's gonna demonstrate its flight capabilities, let's say. And once I have that, I'll be well positioned to go and get the $3 million round that I need next. But anyway, so you've identified that million dollars and you think, gosh, you know, I wanna have at least, you know, I don't wanna have more than 10 investors. So that means, you know, on average, they gotta, you know, be investing at least $100,000, which means I don't wanna take a check less than 50,000. And you sort of line them up so that you can do a closing all at once. So you've vetted them, you've negotiated the terms, and you've signed and closed with them. All that needs to get done prior to closing, um, as well as complying with securities laws and the corporate um, governance that you've got. So doing a board consent, that type of thing. But we're going to be walking through that in a moment. So if I said it really quickly, don't panic. Um, and we can always revisit it too. Uh, and of course, today's event is being recorded. So you can go back and watch the transcript, read the transcript and or uh, play it back in slow-mo, I guess.
All right. So in the seed space, we're talking about raising funds to build the initial minimum viable product and getting that initial team together. And typically what we're seeing is, you know, if we're talking about sort of, sub, especially out here in the Bay Area, like sub $3 million rounds, um, it's going to get done in a safe or a convertible note. And I mean, we may even have successive rounds that are three or five or six. I mean, I've definitely had companies, work with companies that have had five, 10, 15 million um, raising that way. Although those, you know, are kind of fewer and farther between, but it's possible. And convertible notes sometimes also go by the name of a bridge note. So I feel like that's a less common name, but it was more common 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And the idea was sort of to bridge you, to get you the bridge, build a bridge from where you are right now to where you need to go to get that venture around. And I like to think of basically convertible debt as being the parent of convertible equity, which is more commonly known as SAFES, a simple agreements for future equity that's put out by Y Combinator. Um, so, you know, by and large today, we're going to be talking about raising probably less than $3 million, although, you know, wouldn't be odd to see it sometimes creep up to five or wouldn't be odd to see a couple of a couple million dollar rounds raised in this manner. You know, if we were talking about raising 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, probably talking about doing a venture round, maybe a series seed round, um, or a series A round, and that's a different presentation. So let's talk about why we end up with a convertible security. So the, the, the feature of the convertible security is that it's gonna change into equity in the future at a pre-negotiated rate um, at a, future qualified equity financing. So that basically means in that series seed or that series A round. And why, 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 why would we wait until then to convert this into equity, right? Into shares of preferred stock? Well, two things. It avoids valuing the company now. Uh, and the reason why Folks like to delay, there are a few reasons, but you know, chief among them, why delaying the company, valuing the company now is very, it's very difficult to really accurately value an early stage company. You got no revenue. You may or may not have the team together. Who knows if you can get you know, this plane off the ground. And the risk here is if you are, the founder and you undervalue the company, you've sold too much of the company and you're gonna find yourself more diluted than you need to be as you move down in time. And the risk for the investor is you paid too much, right? So the way to kind of get around or to navigate that issue is to kick the can down the road wait till the company is further along, and then you know, have there be some discount, which basically acts as a kicker or a sweetener so that whoever invests in the convertible security ends up better off than what the Series C or Series A, but better off because they took more risk. They invested earlier when it was more risky to invest in the company. Another reason is it is less expensive to raise on a convertible note or a safe, generally speaking, is less expensive to raise on a convertible note or safe than it is to raise on a preferred stock financing. There is a lot less to negotiate, okay? I mean, just go on the Y Combinator site, take a look at their safe versus go to the nvca.com.org site and look at the suite of venture documents. Okay, you'll see it's like five pages, uh, it might be the old form of safe. The old form of safe. It's like five to seven pages. 
versus a hundred plus a whole bunch of other documentation, plus the diligence is much more extensive and thorough in a price round. It also has some incidental value uh, benefits, which are, you know, you may be able to take a, a position longer that your equity grants to your employees, you know, don't need, the exercise price doesn't necessarily need to be as high, right? Um, those things pop up can be helpful, you know, versus if you've got an arm's length negotiated transaction pinning the value in the company. So this always kicks off the question, well, we're, we're, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So let me just mention this. The question is, isn't, isn't a cap valuing the company? Let's put a pin on that and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So what you'll see in convertible securities, I've listed here and I think also on the next set of slides. Yeah, we'll kind of go into this. Um, but if you got a convertible note, you'll see a maturity date, which is the date the money needs to get paid back. You'll also see an interest rate if you've got a convertible note, okay? Because it's it's debt, so it's got a principal and it's got interest, and you got to pay that money back. Conversion terms. So those are the terms, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But like, how is it that you take this investment, that hundred thousand dollars that gets put in, and change that or convert it into preferred stock, typically preferred stock? And then amendment terms. So this is something that I think if you're not a lawyer practicing in this space, you kind of miss sometimes why it's important to have a feature in these instruments that allows the holders of a majority of interest to amend the terms of the security. So you don't have to go out and get each individual investor to sign an amendment. Now you may say, well, why, why wouldn't I want to do that? Especially if I were an investor. And it, it's probably true. Probably each individual investor, I guess it's maybe game theory, right? Each individual, individual investor wants to have control over his, her, or its investment. But the reality of it is, is that if each investor has his, her, its own uh, veto right, they can block a deal. Remaining terms. Uh, I would say, especially for safes, it's not necessarily that common to negotiate them. Now, I say that with an asterisk in the sense that older form of safes, so like pre-2018 safes, which are still floating around and still get used, everyone's got, or a lot of, a lot of lawyers, including myself, have some routine edits and amendments to them. Um, even the newer forms, I've got some edits and amendments that I like to use, but these things are not usually highly negotiated. The main, the main terms that are negotiated, if you've got a convertible note, are the maturity, the interest rate, and the conversion terms, and sometimes the amendment terms. And what we sort of generally see in the maturity is 18 to 24 months. But what you really need to be thinking about here is this is going back to the term, kind of a bridge, right? And what, what are my capital requirements gonna be over what period of time? And is this gonna be enough money to get me to achieve that targeted milestone, right? That, that building of that model plane with then enough time to go out and do a road show to close the next round of financing, whether that is another round of sort of convertible notes or safes or whether that is a price round. And it always takes longer to raise around than you think, and it takes more energy. Um, and especially on convertible note side, you know there is a California um, financing law which is out there, and there are normally a number of exceptions and exemptions, and it's important to make sure you kind of target those. And there are similar ones um, in other jurisdictions, and you know those are about protection for. The debtor. Um, and so making sure, you know, these are basically financing laws that protect the debtors, in this case, the company. So make sure that you got the compliance with that. On the interest rates, you know, you can see them um, as low as the AFR, the applied federal rate, um, the applicable federal rate. And otherwise, you're going to have imputed interest and tax on them. And then you can go as high as the usury laws. But, you know, the interest is not really 
where, um, sorry, I'm just going back to make sure I didn't miss anything. The interest is not really where the money is made, if you will, it's, uh, it's on the conversion to equity. So that's on this next slide. And I apologize, because I'm probably going to sneeze in a moment. But um, so maturity conversion is going to be at a discount of the price paid in the next qualified financing. And we'll run through some actual or some hypothetical numbers a little bit in a couple of slides. But what you need to know is, you know, we, we usually typically define a qualified financing to mean something. So you can't just have your uncle, you know, put in $10, you know, to buy some stock and value the company at $10 billion, which would thereby really heavily dilute your uh, convertible note or safe holders absent them having a cap. And even then, if, you're, if you were to get your uncle to do that, it probably you know, is for nefarious purposes. So um, you know, we typically will see that it'll be an equity financing, maybe a preferred stock equity financing. So, and then there's gonna be a minimum round size to know that people are actually putting in enough money so that there's enough skin in the game to, you know, ensure that there's a, a well bargain for price, you know, per share. And then there's gonna, you know, one of the mechanisms we commonly see is a discount. So, you know, if, and we'll run through some numbers on this, but like if a preferred investor pays a buck a share and there's a 20% discount, well, then the convertible notes are gonna roll over at 80%, 80 cents a share. So, and we'll, we'll run through that. Now let's talk about the cap because I put a little pin in the cap before. A conversion price cap is sort of a maximum bound of what the sort of pre-money valuation of a company is going to be. What the heck does that mean, you might ask? Well, we'll run through the numbers in a minute, but what you have to understand is it, it is kind of a proxy of saying like, you know, when when a preferred equity financing happens, we're gonna pretend, we're gonna act as if the company is not more valuable than whatever that conversion price cap is gonna be. Um, these also come up in other contexts, the conversion upon a change of control or sale, or sometimes we build these in, in case we're concerned, um, what happens if you hit maturity and you haven't had a qualified equity financing or qualified financing? Um, and so, you know, we use that in a, sometimes we'll use them in a couple of different contexts and sometimes it will be different ones. The one for maturity will be different than the one for uh, a change of control event, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, by and large, the purpose and point of caps are usually, especially in the context of converting in a, in a preferred stock financing to act as a sweetener so that if the money that's put in by the angel or seed investors actually really enables the company to have just substantial growth. And the, the issue is if you don't have the cap in there, well, maybe, maybe the discount itself is not enough, okay? The, the, those investors are gonna feel like they got more diluted than they should have been. Um, then they didn't really get to capture sort of all the appropriate upside that they, they wanted to see. So then the question, which I raised earlier is, well, like, isn't, isn't a cap, um, isn't a cap value in the company? And I mean, I think the real answer to that is, no, we're using these instruments because we're trying to avoid taking a firm and hard position on it. It's, you know, that, that's the primary motivator for these. Um, you know, and then the negotiation sort of usually sort of breaks out. If you are company side, you kind of want to try and hit, you kind of want to have a cap that is not going to be any less than what you anticipate the pre-money valuation of your preferred stock financing to be, right? That way the cap doesn't actually sort of get triggered. And if you're on the investor side, you want to you try and push it down, right? Because you want to 
because founders are known sometimes for being sort of over, overly optimistic. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, maybe, maybe you want to be able to pick up the middle point on that. And I think actually just going back real quick, because I think it's one other thing that's really important to think about in terms of interest rates and convertible notes. You know, interest accrues in convertible notes. So if you've got a discount, the interest rate kind of acts as a way to juice the discount. So I say that in the context of the cap in so far as like, you really kind of need to be paying attention to all of these things at once because they all go into basically how, how many shares the, what percentage the seed investors are going to have when they convert. Uh, I, I feel like I have to sneeze again. So I apologize for that. So let's talk a little bit about structures and then I'm going to take some questions. Um, yeah. So the structure convertible notes are usually sort of one or two documents. It's usually either sort of an integrated purchase agreement and note or, you know, and the purchase agreement basically deals with the relationship between all the different parties, the company and each of the different investors and kind of how they're going to handle things um, and different representations and warranties. And the note themselves are usually, you know, the sort of economic terms or those two documents can get integrated. And I've seen that, you know, pretty frequently um, into, and that's pretty common these days into just one convertible note security. And a safe is just one agreement. Now, that being said, that's not to say that's the only thing you need to do. You should, you should be checking through your corporate bylaws and your certificate of incorporation in Delaware or whatever, wherever you're organized and you know, getting the right corporate authorization in place for these things as well. Um, so just kind of in sum and recap, before we move into valuation basics and dilution, where we'll start to apply this. Upside for convertible securities, like this is sort of the most common form kind of million, two million raise, three million, sometimes more, but you know, certainly in the one, two million sphere. It avoids value in the company, um, which is difficult to do and helps maintain a, the argument that there's a low fair market value of the stock for option grants and restricted stock. That way, you know, to the extent you issue options or you issue stock, you know, you grant options or you issue stock to employees, they don't have to pay as much for their stock, right? And the downside, especially for convertible notes, is that it's debt and it may need to get repaid at some point. And then another thing is that, you know, in terms of the preference stack, you know, if the company gets sold or otherwise gets liquidated, the notes get paid first before any of the, any of the equity. So before the preferred, before the common. All right, let me just see if I can ask, answer some questions here. We got a great question. Are we still seeing people use the old, more founder-friendly version of the safes? Yeah, the answer is I, I, we do see them. Um, you know, I think they're, I see them less and less, but I definitely still see them getting done. You know, especially if companies already had, had raised some, they'll probably continue to raise off of that. Um, you know, between the older and the new form of safes, and we can probably kind of, you know, talk about this in the Q&A section, but uh, the real key, I think, is just building those pro forma cap tables. And I've got a different presentation who I, who I actually kind of partner with a CFO to do the presentation. Um, and it's great. And I'm sure we'll do it, you know, in the next six months. But in terms of building pro forma cap tables, that's critical. Uh, why would early investors prefer safes or convertible notes over equity? Couldn't they, couldn't, okay. So again, the reason why safe or convertible note investors would take safes or convertible notes over equity, well, what does equity mean? You know, is equity is either common stock or preferred stock. Um, if they're investors, they probably want to have bells and whistles like a liquidation preference, like getting paid before the common stock. Um, you know, the right to convert into common stock, maybe anti-dilution rights in case the, you know, the company doesn't do as well as everyone sort of thinks that it's going to do. And, you know, by the time you get all 
done negotiating all that, you're in multiples more than if you were doing a safer convertible note. Plus the real driving, I mean, the probably in, in that sort of transaction cost is probably the tail that wags the dog. I mean, the dog in this case is the risk of valuing over or undervaluing the company. And it's just kind of what's done. It's just, it's what's, it's what's market. What are pro forma cap tables? So a pro forma cap table is a cap table that is a model cap table of what you'd expect the capitalization cable. That is who all the owners are. Um, you know, and we do usually do also list safes and convertible notes on there, even if we don't sort of convert them over into shares of common, but we list them, you know, as of some period of time or some event like the financing, you know. Um, usually the interest rolls on convertible notes. So someone's asking if you got to pay it over time uh, and there's some tax impacts of that, which you got to talk to account tax accountant about. So what happens if there's no qualified event by the time the notes mature? Great question. So this kind of circles back and really hits and illustrates one of the provisions that I think is very critical early on, which is making sure you've got an amendment provision so you can have the holders of the majority of the outstanding principal and interest in the case of a note, uh, extend the maturity date or to deal with that issue. So, um, you know, if you've got a note that's, not really well suited for this purpose, you, you might hit maturity and the company has to pay the, the note back. And then theoretically, it could get pushed into bankruptcy. If it's sort of better drafted, um, maybe you hit maturity and the note just becomes due, but it's not payable. So the money actually isn't come back, isn't, pay, isn't payable until you get a holder, holders of the outstanding um, principal to act on that, principal and interest to act on that. Or, you know, sometimes we do build into features to be able to convert them either at the option of the company or option of the investor into common stock. So, you know, for those reasons, convertible notes, um, you know, take more time and energy. There's not as much of a standard convertible note as there is with a safe. I'm just taking a look through other questions to see if there's anything that's really good. Uh, someone wants to know what the low end, the sort of minimum raises that we see off of these. Well, I think it's really more bound by the transaction costs associated with them. So if you're gonna be spending a few thousand dollars to kind of get this documented, you're not gonna to want to, um, only raise a few thousand dollars, you know, you're gonna to wanna to see tens to hundreds raised, I think. Um, and one of the ways to sort of deal with that is to, you know, line up a bunch of investors and sort of close them all at once rather than doing sort of like a rolling close. Okay, let's, let's roll into the valuation basics. So, what I want to do is I want to take, you know, we just talked about discounts and caps at a high level. And I think that that's in one sense helpful so that you know that these things exist, but it's unhelpful because you don't get to see them imply, applied. So I've built some really, really simple, simple, simple kind of examples just to give you a flavor of kind of what this sort of starts to look like. Again, this is not my pro forma cap table presentation. That's a different one. Um, but I want you to get familiar with it. So I want you to be familiar with some terms. And again, there's a lot of breathing room in terms in, in the venture space. So I think it's really important to get a sense of what it is, which is what I'm going to give you. But then you always got to read the fine print. And there's plenty of room to sort of negotiate over these things. But the concept of pre-money valuation is the valuation of the company before the next round of investment comes in. So, you know... Right before, you know, if you're raising $3 million, whatever the value of the money of the company is going to be right before that $3 million comes in. And then post money is the value of the company right after that $3 million comes in. So if your company was $10 million pre-money and then you got $3, $3 million more, 
you got on a post money basis, right when that money comes in, your company is worth $13 million. Now, the other concept, which I alluded to before, is a fully diluted basis. We hear that all the time. Again, a term, just like the other two terms, that have everyone has sort of a general sense for it and a general understanding for it, but you got to read the fine print on these things. Um, but when we think about fully diluted basis, we usually think about all of the common stock that is issued and outstanding, plus all securities that can be converted into common, plus typically the shares reserved for equity compensation. And we usually think about these things on an as converted basis. So if you've got safes or convertible notes, we think about when we're trying to do that fully diluted basis calculation, we convert them over and we think about them as being converted. Now, you can't really do that because of the way that the, the terms are in the safes and convertible notes. You can't really do that unless and until you got a pre-money valuation. And so when you're building a pro forma cap table, if you don't have an offer from an investor, you're taking, you're running a hypothetical, right? It's a model. You say, well, if if we agree that the pre-money valuation is X, this is what everything is going to convert over. So with that in mind, let's take a really simple example um, and just kind of understand how the pie gets split up. Okay, so we're actually not even going to put the option pool or other equity incentive plan or other equity in play in this example. I just want you to get familiar with the concept. I already said it. We got pre-money pre valuation of $10 million. Okay, um, an investment at three dollars, uh, three three million dollars, and let's just say, and again, I wouldn't necessarily take these numbers and set yourself your company up with this, but let's just say we had ten million shares that are split among the three founders. So each founder has three million three hundred thirty three thousand three hundred thirty three shares. Well, on a pre money basis. Each founder has a third of the company or 3,333,333 shares or 33.333% of the company. Now, if that, we're gonna ignore convertible securities, we're gonna go into that in the next slide. But if that money comes in, okay, what's gonna happen is The investor is going to pay, well, so to find the price that the investor is going to pay on a per share basis, you take the pre-money valuation of the company and you divide it by the number of shares that are standing, the fully diluted basis, immediately prior to closing. So you divide 10 million by 10 million and you end up with a buck a share. So if that investor puts in $3 million, they're going to get $3 million divided by a buck a share or 3 million shares, which now means the denominator when you're measuring, uh, you know, so post-closing, founder A still has the 3,333,333 shares, but it's over a denominator of 13 million outstanding, right? Because you got the 10 million common that the founders have and the 3 million that just got issued to the preferred. And so the founder has 25% instead of 33%. Let's throw in the basics with the convertible securities. Now, what you would see if you had a $450,000 convertible security, so whether a safe or a convertible note, and we're just saying there's $450,000 outstanding and it had just a 25% discount, the holder of that security would receive 600,000 shadow sh shares. And we'll talk about shadow sh shares in a second. Um, but basically in this example also, let me just see. Yeah, and I've even sort of further simplified this example because we're sort of extracting ourselves from the circular math, which if you've got Excel, you can use iterative calculations and you can kind of get yourself out of. But if we're just taking, for example, that, okay, the pre-money valuation, or excuse me, the price per share that the preferred is gonna pay is a buck. 
regardless of all the circular math, you just apply the discount to that dollar. So here we see, you know, one minus 0.25, which is the discount times the dollar share. And when you convert that 450,000 over, you're gonna see that the shadow series is gonna have 600,000 shares. If there had been a instrument with a cap instead of a, a $5 million cap instead of a discount, then to find the per share price that the um, convertible security is gonna convert over into, it's gonna be the cap divided by the fully dilute basis. So 5 million divided by 10 million. And you take that number, right? That's your conversion price. And you divide the 450,000 by that 50 cents. And you're gonna see that the investor is gonna end up doing better. He's gonna get 900,000 shares of shadow series. So when you then put those two things together, it just becomes a math equation depending on whatever the agreed upon price is by the preferred that's coming in as to which under, whether it's the discount or the cap, under which situation are those seed investors gonna get the greater number of shares? Now, let's talk about shadow series shares before because you'll see this concept in the safe, which is called like a safe, I think they call them safe shares, um, safe preferred. And in other instruments, they're called shadow series. It's basically the exact same, uh, the exact same preferred that the new money is getting, except for the original issue price is going to be different because again, you know, there's a discount that's being applied and the same thing's going to hold true for the liquidation preference and also for um, dividends and stuff like that, I think. Uh, well, maybe not dividends, but uh, so... I wouldn't get hung up on this on the shadow series thing. It's just it's the concept of well, look, they're paying something different than what the new money is paying. So on the economics, we're just going to kind of adjust it to make it fair, so they don't get an extra liquidation preference. So with that in mind, we have kind of run through our time. Um, so what I'm going to do is take some questions, um, and I'm also going to kind of maybe weave in some common pitfalls. Yeah, so um, question is always comes up, you know, question on fees for safes or convertible notes. I think, I, honestly, like that's a conversation you need to have with your counsel, whether that's me, if we end up working together or someone else, because each situation is going to be different. I will tell you, on the very, very, very clean and light end, um, you know, you're looking at a few thousand dollars, you know, um, I would probably say, uh, uh, you know, under 10, depending upon what's going on, but it can get expensive and it can get complicated, um, you know, in, if you're raising a lot, it, you know, depending on a number of variables, which can include the number of investors that you're bringing in, where those investors are located, whether or not those vet investors want side letters and side letters are on my common pitfalls, excuse me, my common pitfalls list here. Side letters are rights that are negotiated outside of the safe or the convertible note. They may include things like pro rata rights or information rights, other rights. Um, and each one of those is probably going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to do. And we're seeing them become more and more common and popular. So it's common. It's not unusual to have, you know, that issue come up, but you certainly don't want to be you know, doing a raise where you're going to have 10 different side letters that's each uniquely sort of negotiated because uh, that's going to run your bill up sig significantly. Uh, if someone's asking about assumed par value versus authorized method. That's, that's a taxing issue and basically being able to reduce the taxes that you have to pay in Delaware. Oh, will, will a seed investor typically also want a representation in the board? Um, and how do you kind of, how do you navigate that? That's a, a great sort of jumping off point. Um, I wouldn't say it's very common to see seed investors take board seats. Um, 
maybe maybe if it's a micro VC that's playing in this space, <clears throat> or they're going to be bringing something else to the table. Um, you might, and or they're putting in, I don't know, maybe maybe they are some sort of super crazy angel and they're doing a seed investment, but they're putting in $10 million or something. Um, that would be a little bit, but you know, you could, you could see a business reason and case for that. Um, more commonly, we would see an observer rights uh, grant to them. So the ability to observe and or maybe speak at a board meeting, but not have a vote being board member position, so not actually be a board member. Um, you do want to be very judicious in terms of uh, handing out, or not handing out, but as you dispense with board seats, observer seats, and officer and director positions, because it is hard and difficult to extract people from those. Um, and remember that uh, maybe I didn't say the time horizon, but the sort of typical time horizon for a venture investment, if you got a venture, a traditional venture fund is sort of seven years and you're going to be raising a bunch of different rounds of capital. So you will need, you'll need room on the board. So um, lots of people sort of ask for that, but well, I wouldn't say it's a super common ask, but it, it's not unusual to see those asks. It's not usual to sort of see them uh, absent some sort of real business consideration, you know, be accepted and have them actually sort of make sense. You know, and in terms of board comp, I mean, usually in the seed stage, we see kind of the founder, you know, a founder or founders filling all the board seats, if not controlling the board. And it's usually either sort of one or three. And every if it's three, everyone kind of understands you know, who may need to resign in connection with uh, preferred equity financing. So it's not contentious. So I'm getting a lot of structuring questions about uh, Delaware C Corps versus Illinois C Corps or NJ C Corps. Um, you know, those types of things are not sort of a general applicability. You know, if you want to have a general conversation about it, I do keep uh, office hours. So you can send me an email. Again, don't send me any confidential information. We need to run a conflicts check and get a written engagement agreement in place first, but happy to. Um, have a more general, you know, have a similar general conversation as to what we think about for each of those things. Yeah. So I have a question about if someone is asking about equity crowdfunding. So I will say that it is, how do I say this? It's kind of outside the scope of today's conversation. So we're focused on raising either from venture investors or from angels or, or you know, the folks in that space. The crowdfunding presents a number of challenges in the venture space. It can be done. It can be done well and executed well. Also sort of <clears throat> by crowdfunding right now, I'm talking about equity crowdfunding on these sort of non-equity crowdfunding that can also be done really, really well, but it's, it's really, um, it's beyond the scope of today's conversation. Okay, so, someone's at, um, again, I don't know, someone's got a general question about Delaware and their sort of taxing and authorized shares. They may want to take a look at the assumed par value method, uh, but I'm not really in a position to weigh in on their specific situation. Um, can, he, can we talk about what happens to the cap table by way of dilution? Again, yeah, so um, again, I've got a separate presentation on, on 
running pro forma cap tables and, and dilution, because that's, I think every founder's biggest nightmare, but you know, what you have to understand is the model typically, you know, is built on the fact that there will be 20, 25% uh, of the company being sold sort of in each round, roughly. Sometimes it'll be 15, sometimes it'll be 25, might be up or down. Maybe as you get to later stage, you're able to leverage it by doing some venture debt or some non-dilutive financing. But you will see that the ownership stake in the uh, by the founders is gonna go down over time. Now, that's counterbalanced by the fact that you know, you get that additional capital in, you're able to continue to build out the company, you grow the pie bigger, each, you know, although your slice on a percentage basis may be decreasing, it's sort of getting bigger, thicker, uh, more valuable. So that, that's sort of the name of the game there. I just, uh, question about needing a lawyer to do a safe with investor. You know, I, I do think you need a venture. I, I do think you are wise to have an emerging growth or venture capital attorney when you're, if you're doing a safe with a venture investor um, or an angel investor. I mean, because one of two things happens. Either you've got a sophisticated investor who plays in this space a lot and they're going to be able to kind of, and you know, and this may be the first time you're doing a safe. And so you kind of don't understand what you're doing or executing and they can run circles around you. Or you may be working with uh, somebody who doesn't really know. And all of a sudden you start negotiating all kinds of oddball provisions that become a problem later. So I, you think you definitely need to work with somebody who understands the space and, and knows what's market. Okay. Um, a question about setting aside X. So this is a great question because it one, it's one that comes up all the time. Setting aside equity for investors. So that is, I think, maybe a common misunderstanding among founders is sort of thinking, okay, well, we will set aside so much common or we will create preferred at the outset and set that aside for our venture investors. Um, and the sort of nice thing is you don't need to worry about setting aside preferred for investors at the outset, especially if you're working with competent counsel because the way the path works is in connection with negotiating a venture financing, you're going to amend and restate the certificate of incorporation to create the preferred stock that has been negotiated upon uh, between the company and the venture investors. So good news is you don't need to do it. Another, another thing is you really can't do it because you don't know what the, you know, what the various preferences that are going to be negotiated on by the parties unless and until you negotiate them with the party. So no, you do not need to set aside equity for investors. You do need to make sure you set aside enough equity. Well, let me take a step back. You don't want to go, you, you know, you don't want to issue more shares than are authorized under your certificate of incorporation. That can lead to a lot of headache and expense and cleanup. Now, if you have not authorized enough shares, don't panic, you know, so long as you haven't gone above the authorized level, you know, there's a simple solution, which is to amend the certificate of incorporation to increase the number of authorized shares. Now, that may require a board, you know, board vote, and, you know, board approval, and also stockholder approval, um, but it's not a you should panic situation. How do you find angels while still complying with securities laws? 
could you please provide a few legal options? So each one of these situations is going to be unique, um, but you know, by and large, what you want to be doing is working within your network and building substantial relationships with individuals prior to making an ask so that they've got a sense for whether or not they should invest and put your, their money in you. Um, so, you know, what you don't want to do is you don't want to just put it on your website for raising money, you know, yeah, click here if you're interested, you know, what you don't want to do is, you know, take out an ad in a paper um, and sort of between that end of the spectrum or, and sort of only, only raising from yourself or maybe one of your co-founders, right? There's a big, there's a big continuum, right? And so it's going to be very, it's very fact specific, but sort of by and large, you know, if you are um, kind of working with counsel who can apprise you what to do uh, for your specific situation, I think you will be able to navigate it. You know, I think you'll be able to navigate it. Um, so there's a question about finding investors that are interested. Uh, this person said sympathetic, but let's say interested in your business or cause. Um, well, a couple of things like one is, so we're talking about venture capital today. Um, and I think doing a real honest assessment of what it is that your business plan is, is a great first step, right? Um, you know, know where it is that you want to go and what, what the path is gonna to be to get there and then figure out what the right audience is. Now, if you kind of fit into the venture bucket, which is you know from when you raise your first venture funds, you expect an exit in five to seven years and you expect the company is gonna you know, be worth 10, 20 times whatever they put their money in or, 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 or they're gonna get the return of 10 or 20 or more. Um, depending upon where they are in the round and, or excuse me, where they are in the company's life cycle. Um, but that sounds like maybe it's a venture play. And also if the numbers are sufficient enough, right? I mean, even if, even if, you know, if your company only took $500,000 to scale, even if there was going to be a 20 X return, it kind of isn't, it's not a sufficient scale for the venture fund. So if you're talking about, if you're in that space, that's the sort of model to do it. If you, are in, if you're thinking about doing something else, build a great business, you know, uh, whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit business, but just understand what it is that you're trying to do um, first and foremost, and then understand who is interested in that. You know, and that's your audience. Yes. So there's sort of a question about building relationships. I think you should build relationships with, with counsel um, early uh, and, and it should be a long-term relationship. You want counsel that will grow with you. Um, in terms of where I, you know, so I have clients all throughout the country. Well, I have clients in the Bay area throughout the rest of the country and throughout the rest of the world. Uh, so, so I am up all the time, <laughs> although of course, obviously I sleep, but, <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of what I do, I mean, one of the great things about being at the firm that I'm at is that we've got, uh, offices in, we've got over 40 different offices in five different continents. So we're in Europe, you know, we're in the middle East, we're in Asia, we're in Australia, uh, North America, obviously, South America. So that's one of the things I rely upon is getting to work with my colleagues here. And then outside, you know, so that's one reason why I'm able to work with folks all over the world. And then the other reason is also build relationships or, and have relationships outside the firm. So, you know, I do what I do that I do well, right? So that's venture capital, corporate work, and then work with IP specialists and other folks. So, um, you know, I, you don't need to be in California if you think we might be a fit. Oh, all right, great. I'm okay. Thank you. I'm I'm glad someone's looking at my common pitfalls and they've got a question about finders. <clears throat> so, non-compliance with securities laws 
is is an issue and we've talked about that and finders is sort of like a sub issue so there are a lot of people throughout the bay area throughout the country throughout the world who will say we will get you connected to capital just give us a piece of the action or you know whether that's cash or equity in your company and that most of the time, unless they're a registered broker dealer here in the US with the SEC, or there's another exemption, um, is not going to be in compliance with the securities law. So there are, there is, or there is on the way a finder's exemption, but we don't really feel it, find it very relied upon. And so the sort of pitfall here is trusting someone who's going to help find you capital. You just need to give them a piece of the action, but they're not, they're not a registered broker dealer be a violation of securities laws can end up being a bust in your reps because this is something that are in the safes, in the convertible notes, and may end up in a, in a situation where in order to try and fix it, you got to offer a right of rescission. You got to offer to give the investor their money back. Thank you for asking about that. Um, talk a little bit more about side letters. Okay, so side letters are agreements outside of the safe or the convertible note for various things. Um, pro rata rights. So pro rata rights would be, it's one of these things, again, where there's a general sense for it, but you got to read the fine print. But the general sense is it's going to give the investor the right to buy securities in the future in order to maintain their relative position in the company, right? So if they've got three, the equivalent of 3% when this deal closes, they'll get, they'll get the right to buy at least 3% in the next round so that they maintain their pro rata share, their percentage share. Um, the reason why they do that is venture investors and angel investors frequently do not deploy all the capital that they can deploy. They wanna give you some of the money, see if you can hit that objective, right? If you can hit that objective, great, they want more. If you can't hit that objective, they cut their losses. So they wanna have that right. They don't wanna get cut out. Uh, information rights can come in a couple of different forms. I mean, it could come, they wanna be able to get the books of the company. They wanna be able to consult with management or maybe you know the sort of observer rights kind of falls into that bucket. It's a more extensive information rights, if you will. How they get negotiated, you know, usually they will, uh, the investor will ask for it. And then you kind of go, go back and forth and sort of determine whether or not it's appropriate. Now, it's always really good to think about these things ahead of time, right? I want to, you know, as we were talking about before, figuring out what your raise is going to be, from whom you're going to raise it, and trying to drive all that to have hopefully a single, single closing, right, on a certain terms that you've identified. And whether or not you're going to be giving out any observer seats, board seats, you know, we'll be willing to tolerate any of that is good to think through ahead of time. Another thing that comes up from time to time, especially if you're going to be dealing with strategic investors, is they may want to take, they may want to have some sort of commercial term in there, right? They may want to be the exclusive supplier, or they may want you, they, they may want you to be their exclusive supplier for something. Um, so those are all, I mean, it's a separate negotiation where um, the sky is the limit in terms of what they ask for and what you can negotiate. And so just be mindful of that uh, will be helpful to keep Mets and bounds and keep yourself in budget. Uh, you wanna know an example of having to amend the certificate? Do you have to register with the SEC? Uh, I think the question is here is, Earlier, I mentioned that if you have not authorized enough shares under your charter and you want to do another financing, you want to be able to sell some of them, you'll need to amend the charter, the certificate of corporation before you do that. Um, you know, as to the question of whether or not you have to register with the SEC, it's going to determine, it's going to depend on whether or not you've targeted, you know, appropriate securities exemptions to registration. 
Um, yeah. Uh, how is equity distributed to early employees or strategic advisors? Does equity need to be set aside from the start? Yeah, I mean, I would keep some room for them. I wouldn't necessarily issue all of the authorized shares to the founders. One other area of confusion that gets kind of brought up is um, many times first-time founders will um, think that in sort of determining the fully diluted basis, they'll take their shares and divide it. They'll use the authorized number of authorized shares as the denominator. That's not right. It's usually the issued and outstanding and or any, you know, convertible notes, safes, equity incentive plan, you know, all on an as converted basis. Um, well, convertible notes or safes on an as converted basis and you know, probably the entire equity incentive plan to the extent you have one. That's how you would sort of think about fully diluted basis there. It's not the number of authorized shares. Uh, can you shed some light on the pool of the employee option as a pitfall in real deals? Um, I'm not sure. I want to just talk about, since I mentioned the employee option pool, also sometimes goes by equity incentive plan, in which case you could issue more than options, more than just options like restricted stock, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, there are sort of like rules of thumb out there that, you know, maybe you want to have 10 or 15% of an option pool, like of reserved for the option pool to be available under the option pool as of the close of the let's say series A is your first price round. Again, that's kind of the rule of thumb when you don't have any real data to work for. Hopefully, you know, by the, and, and, and that's probably a great starting point from, you know, as you're modeling pro forma cap tables. But, you know, when you get to that series A or series C, whatever you're gonna call it, um, that initial preferred round, you know, what really you should, hopefully have thought through is, again, you're raising this money so that you can achieve certain objectives. And to get and hit those objectives, you know you need to hire this kind of engineer and this kind of salesperson, this kind of, and you sort of already, you've estimated the number of options that you'll need to grant. And so that should really be what you're targeting. You know, that plus a little bit of breathing room should be what you're really targeting <clears throat> in terms of having sufficient shares available in the option pool, you know, at the closing of the series of the preferred stock financing. So that's that aspect. In terms of any pitfalls that come up, you know, sometimes it happens where, uh, You'll have a couple founders, you'll set up the option pool um, kind of based on, you know, and have a certain percentage available as of, you know, the series A or even before, before. And then those founders will leave, their shares will get revest, will get repurchased. And so it's kind of for, for all, um, what's the bit? It's kind of the reverse of dilution, but not necessarily in a good way, like everybody's percentages go up, um, but the founders will feel that, um, the, the remaining founder will feel that maybe the employees have kind of too much equity um, or the option pool is too large. Now, if the option pool itself is too large, you can reduce the number of shares that are reserved under it. Um, you know, the ones that are available to issue, but if they've already been granted, you can't, you can't, you can't ungrant them. Uh, I mean, you couldn't ungrant them without probably sign off by that employee. Um, you have to talk to a benefits person, but I don't think you can ungrant them. You know, in, instead, what's going to happen is, you know, maybe that founder might need to get topped up in connection with uh, financing, although that's kind of easier said than done. 
Is this a case by case basis? And with that in mind, actually, I can't I can't believe we've just totally blown through the time. It's gone by. It's been it's gone by so quickly. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time today. I want to say, you know, I want to thank Idea to IPO for organizing. I want to thank my firm, KNL Gates, for you know making this event possible. I want to thank each of the members of the audience, whether you're here live with me today or you're watching, you know, uh, in a time shifted event. Thank you very much for attending. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, just to stay in touch generally, that's great. Go for it, Jason Putnam Gordon. If you want to take advantage of office hours, again, don't send me either way. Don't send me any confidential information uh, unless we're engaged in a client relationship, but and not a but, but you know, feel free to reach out jason.gordon at knlgates.com. Until the next one, thank you again. And uh, I'm going to let you get back to building your great company. Take care. Bye-bye.